Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles and today let's just say I can't wait to see the comments section after you've watched this one all the way through to the end and for a couple of reasons the first of which let's just get this one out of the way right at the start this is Asian Death God in the Japanese tier 8 fast battleship the Amagi the Amagi is known for many things it's fast at least by battleship standards, it is armed with 10 extremely potent 16-inch guns. What it is not known for, however, is the efficiency of its secondary gun batteries. So here's our first point of controversy. This is a secondary build Amagi. Yeah. <laughs> now having secondary builds on Japanese battleships isn't completely out of the question. At least not on certain Japanese battleships. The key, for example, the Tier 8 Premium, can make a surprisingly effective secondary brawler. And that's because the majority of the key's secondaries are 100mm guns. And Japanese 100mm guns, because of destroyers like the Kitakaze, the Akazuki and the Harugamo, are blessed with quarter caliber high explosive penetration the same as the germans so even though the caliber of the guns is small they basically have the inertia fuse for high explosive shell skill built in for free and on the key it can be surprisingly effective to go for a secondary build but that's on the key the amagi secondaries are either 127 or 140 millimeter guns and they do not get the benefit of that quarter caliber high explosive shell penetration so a secondary build on the key actually kind of makes sense but a secondary build on the amagi particularly since while the amagi is many things it is definitely not a brawler it has accurate hard-hitting long-ranged guns and very good speed but it doesn't have armor so even with the secondary skills and modules that Asian Death God has fitted in order to extend the range of his secondary gun batteries out to 10 kilometers, which is pretty good. I mean, it's still short range by German standards, but it's really good by Japanese standards. 10 kilometers is closer than I'd prefer to get to particularly an enemy battleship in an Amagi. Because while the Amagi can definitely dish the damage out, it's not that good at taking it. Although it does take it better than tier 6 cruisers that expose broadside to battleships at that kind of range in a tier 8 battle. Such is the fate of all tier 6 cruisers who get themselves spotted broadside on in open water through battleships in tier 8 battles. Pesky little New Orleans ducked in behind the spit of land over there and what is this Richelieu doing? Other than dodging torpedoes... Oh, do you see what Asian Death God's doing here? He's getting greedy. The front turrets were ready to fire, but he held his fire until the rear turrets also had the target. But he waited so long, because he's moving forward, that at the time the rear turrets were ready to fire, both of the front turrets and at least one of the rear turrets were occluded by the island and didn't actually have the shot. So he cost himself a fair bit of damage there by waiting and holding his fire until all of his turrets were trained on target. The New Orleans, however, appears to have severely miscalculated just exactly how long a 30 second reload lasts. He's starting to reverse now. And he was very lucky to get away with the minimal damage. I think they were just overpens. The secondaries are starting to score hits. But the Japanese secondaries aren't particularly accurate either. It's not like the Massachusetts, for example, which not only has great range, but great accuracy on its secondaries. Still, hits are hits. He's going to have to fire blind at New Orleans there. He's currently on 44,000 damage. And... Yeah, that wasn't too bad, actually. 8,000 damage or so. Nothing that New Orleans is going to be worrying about, however. The New Orleans, who is smarter than he's letting on, waited precisely for Asian Death God to fire before getting that salvo off. And it did set a fire, but with no further danger of additional fires, Asian Death God has used the damage control. He's coming around the other side of the island now because there is a very nasty looking smoke screen over there, which probably contains the enemy Farragut. They do have a Gandhi Armada, 
which has a one tier advantage and a significant health advantage over the Farragut. But the Farragut is surprisingly dangerous, particularly in a gunfight for a tier six destroyer. But while the Gajimada has the advantage of backup from Asian Death Guard's primaries and secondaries and a friendly New Orleans of their own, he's managed to get close enough to the Farragut that he can actually be torpedoed, and the Farragut has backup and support from a few teammates of his own as well. So Asian Death God secondaries finish him off and get the kill, but that has cost the Gajimada, if we get a look at him, way more health than was probably acceptable in a trade with a tier 6 destroyer. That's cost the Gajimada, when we see him you'll see it, nearly two thirds of his health. Asian Death God gets some shots out at the Atlantico over there, but because he was turning it's the rear turrets only, and completely misses. That was unlucky. Not often you get, well I was going to say, it's not often you get broadside battleship targets like that to shoot out in World of Warships, but who am I kidding? <laughs> at some point in every game you play, battleships are going to give you that kind of target to shoot at, and it's usually then when you miss every shot that you fire. If that North Carolina would like to get involved, that would be lovely. Atlantico's still in range. There you see the Gadjimada. He was on full health. Not anymore. The scores are still dead even. This could go either way. It's a standard battle, not domination. There are only two caps. But then the friendly Atlantico manages to put the team ahead by getting a secondary kill on the enemy York. And the enemy Richelieu appears to be absolutely determined to cost the enemy team another battleship. Now, the Gadjimada couldn't use his torpedoes against the Farragut earlier because they're deep water torpedoes. They can only hit cruisers, battleships, and aircraft carriers. But he can use his torpedoes against the Richelieu, who is in open water, given a lovely flat broadside, two Asian Death Gods 16-inch guns. And because he's seen the torpedoes coming, he has to maintain this course and manages to avoid most of them, but he's still a sitting duck for Asian Death God's 16-inch armor-piercing shells. The torpedo threat is now over, however. I mean, that was both of the Gadjimada's torpedo launchers, so the Richelieu knows there are no further torpedoes on the way. And he's just been bitch-slapped twice by Asian Death God's Amagi sitting out of sight on the far side of the island. So now he has absolutely no excuse for continuing to hold the exact same course and speed in open water while Asian Death God just holds position and batters the crap out of his broadside over and over again. And considering he doesn't have hydroacoustic search and the Gadjimada's in smoke, that's a very, um, yeah, let's call it brave. <laughs> that's a very brave choice. Also, the North Carolina is now moving up and we'll also have shots at him. And the North Carolina is also armed with 16-inch guns, and they're more accurate than the guns on the Yamagi. The Gadjimada, however, is suffering from a similar dose of overconfidence, because instead of using that smokescreen to disengage, he seems to be sitting there just waiting for his torpedoes to come off cooldown. And while he does have Asian Death God and the North Carolina backing up, the North Carolina, not through lack of trying, hasn't really managed to do anything, and he no longer has the New Orleans because that just got sniped from across the map by the enemy Atlantico. The Gadjimada compounded his errors by repeatedly pumping his poxy little 5-inch high explosive shells into the belt of the onrushing Richelieu instead of sweeping the superstructure, all of which might have kept him alive long enough for Asian Death God to come to his aid and sink the Richelieu. But of course, well, could have, should have, would have, didn't. Meanwhile, as the Atlantico comes around the corner, given an even juicier target to shoot at than the Richelieu just did, I'd just like to draw your attention to the other side of the map, where we have a Nuremberg, who is clearly trying to set up a torpedo shot on an enemy Mackinson from a range of about four kilometers. And that ended about as well for the Nuremberg as you'd probably expect. Meanwhile, the Atlantico, who's finding the hard way that his 15-inch guns aren't working nearly as well against an angled Amagi as the Amagi's 16-inch guns are working against his unangled belt, and after taking a whopping chunk of damage is now angling away, but he's angling away straight into the island and has run himself aground. It's here where he gets his third unwelcome surprise of the day, because while the Atlantico's secondaries are pretty good, 
He probably wasn't expecting the Yamagis to be as well. At more or less exactly the same time, the North Carolina dispatched the New Orleans, which means this side of the map is now 100% clear of enemy ships. Although possibly not 100% clear of enemy aircraft, but that's going to be down to the enemy Lexington, and there's nothing that Asian Death God can do about that. He takes the opportunity to pop one of his heels. He still has two remaining. Unfortunately, the enemy Tirpitz finishes off the Amalfi. They still have a one-kill advantage, and they do have somebody in the enemy cap circle, the Fabuki over there. But do you see those torpedoes? <laughs> that's the enemy Akatsuki. And that's really bad news for the Mackinson and the Fabuki, but particularly the Mackinson because he's dead. Caught between the Akatsuki's torpedoes and a cross drop from the Lexington. The Fabuki's still alive and he's still inside the cap circle. It's going to be down to the Mackinson. But the Mackinson is a German battlecruiser. German battlecruisers have very, very long range hydro. And he sees the Fabuki. Asian Death God also sees the threat to the Fabuki and realizes that the game is riding on it. And unfortunately for the Mackinson, he is kind of committed here because he must, if not kill, then at least drive the Fabuki out of the cap circle because the game is riding on it. So he's kind of committed to that course and speed. Which means that if the Fabuki's torpedoes don't get him, Asian Death God will. And it's the Fabuki's torpedoes that get him, but the Fabuki is far from safe. Look at all of those torpedoes. Luckily, the Fabuki either saw them in time, or he was pre-angled and expecting the torpedoes and was able to thread the needle between them. So he's still alive, he's still reasonably safe, and he's still inside that cap circle. And the friendly carrier, the Pobeda, or however the hell you pronounce the name of that Russian thing, is doing his best to provide air cover for the Fabuki. And oh no, the Akatsuki. He's risen to the challenge, he knows what it is that he needs to do. Two Japanese destroyers engaged in a gunfight, but one of them has full health and the other one does not. So the Akatsuki had no choice. He had to expose himself to kill that Fabuki. And unfortunately for the Akatsuki, he did it when Asian Death God was sitting here. The friendly carrier had aircraft overhead and the Fabuki smokescreen was expiring. So he wasn't able to use the Fabuki smoke. He's had to pop his own. Some shots coming in there from the North Carolina. And now Asian Death God's got a choice to make. And if you stop to think about it, it's not actually that hard a choice. He's breaking away and disengaging from the Akatsuki. Because it's been a while since that ship launched its torpedoes, and if they're not ready to go, they probably will be soon. And the Amagi doesn't have hydroacoustic search. And thanks to the Fabuki's brief hold on the cap circle, his team are slightly ahead on points, which means that somebody on the enemy team needs to get a kill, and there's the enemy Tirpitz. And you can see Asian Death God trying to figure out the best thing to do here. He doesn't want to expose broadside to the Tirpitz. And it looked like he thought he might be able to make it into cover behind the island, but then he realizes he's not, so he starts angling. And honestly, getting in behind that island may not have been the best idea, even if he had been able to do it before the Tirpitz fired, because that would have had him pinned up against the island and limited in his ability to maneuver with possible Akatsuki torpedoes on the way. Now, these are both tier 8 battleships. And the Amagi definitely has better guns than the Tirpitz, but the Tirpitz has better armour. And despite the fact that Asian Death God is a secondary build Amagi, the Tirpitz still has better secondaries. Now, the friendly carrier did manage to respot and has again respotted the Akatsuki and has potentially saved somebody's arse there by dropping a fighter squadron on top of him to keep him spotted and drive him away from the North Carolina and Asian Death God's battlecruiser. But he does not want to get within six kilometers of the Tirpitz, because that's the range of the Tirpitz's torpedoes. Now he did score a hit there and knock out the torpedo launcher on this side without getting to within six kilometers, so he's gonna be torpedo safe. And he then scores a follow-up hit and permanently disables that torpedo launcher. He managed to execute the turn without getting hammered by the Tirpitz's 15-inch guns, although he is taking a beating from the secondaries, but the Tirpitz has committed the same sin as the Atlantico earlier, and he's pinned up against that island, drastically restricting his ability to manoeuvre. Here come the Lexington's torpedo bombers. This is not going to be fun. 
He takes two of the torpedoes on the chin. That has caused a flood, and he's still getting hammered by the Turpitzer's secondaries, but the is not making this difficult for him. He fires, and while the shots are in the air, he triggers the damage control, kills the Turpitz, and the damage control lasts long enough to ensure that any secondary hits from the Turpitz that were in the air do not set an additional fire, and also takes care of the flood. But here comes the Akatsuki. That, by the way, is the high-caliber Confederate and Kraken. Here come the Akatsuki's torpedoes. The secondaries are hammering in. The friendly carrier has aircraft overhead. The Akatsuki is not going to be able to disengage. The North Carolina is once again a day late and a dollar short to the party and is not really contributing much to the fight here. The friendly carrier is getting stuck in with what he has. They're just torpedo bombers, but anything's better than nothing. The Lexington's dive bombers are coming in. He is on fire. The last gasp here from his 16-inch guns. He does not manage to finish off the Akatsuki. And the combination of the Lexington's bombs and the fire set by the Akatsuki finish him off. So it's two on two. They are still ahead on points though. And there's just under four and a half minutes of the battle left. Here's the problem though. It's a carrier and a battleship against a carrier and a destroyer. Which means that the North Carolina is going to find it 100% completely impossible to hide. So a lot is going to depend on the friendly carrier. There's a lot riding on the shoulders of the carrier here. The Lexington's torpedo bombers are coming in, so he drops fighter cover on top of the North Carolina. But what the Pervader does is going to depend on what the North Carolina does, because he's heading for the enemy cap circle. He's not attempting to break off and disengage. Which he probably could do. I mean, it can't outrun the aircraft, but it can dodge the aircraft and shoot them down. And it technically can't outrun the Akatsuki that the Pervader has spotted again but it can make it much more difficult for the Akatsuki to catch him and torpedo him if he was sailing away from the incoming torpedoes rather than towards them. But that North Carolina is determined that he's going to take this cap circle. And that's playing right into the hands of the enemy team because it means the Lexington gets to cycle its aircraft faster because the North Carolina is getting closer and the Akatsuki doesn't have to get detected chasing after the North Carolina, which is not a slow battleship, in order to get close enough to ensure that its torpedoes are going to have the range to catch up. So the Pervader's hands are kind of tied here. He has to defend the North Carolina. Otherwise the North Carolina is going to get sunk. And that will put the enemy team ahead. Now of course the best defense is a good offense, and the Akatsuki only has 687 health left, but it's an extremely stealthy destroyer. And even if the Pervader's strike aircraft were going to fly right over it, as we've already seen happen, it's not getting spotted until it's way too late to actually conduct an attack. The skip bombers are probably his best weapon against the Akatsuki, but he's going to have to fly over it, spot it, and then come back around for another attack. And he's hidden inside a smoke screen. So the best chance is for him to spot the Akatsuki and have the North Carolina shoot it. But the Akatsuki knows this as well, so he's hiding behind the island. <laughs> Even if he does get spotted, assuming he's still inside the smoke screen, the North Carolina wouldn't be able to shoot at him. All of which is completely irrelevant because despite the Pobeda dropping what may have been his last charge of patrol fighters on top of the North Carolina to protect him from the Lexington's air attacks, the Lexington has sunk him anyway. Which has put the enemy team ahead on points with a minute and a half to go and now everybody in chat is complaining about the carrier and not the North Carolina. <laughs> I did say there were going to be two things happening in this battle for you to have an animated and frank exchange of views over in the comments. The secondary builder Margi was just one. He's managed to spot the Akatsuki again, he's going in for the attack, but he spotted him so late, yep, he's missed. He's going to try again with the rocket attack planes. Praying that the Akatsuki doesn't have a smokescreen left. And he is under air attack himself because that Lexington is obviously not ignoring him. While heading for his own cap circle, which will put the enemy team even further ahead on points if he doesn't get a kill. 
So despite the criticism that the carrier's decision-making process has been attracting in chat from his own team, was he right to play this out the way he did? Because he did try to defend the North Carolina, despite the North Carolina making it as difficult as possible for him to do so, and he did get the Akatsuki, which puts the team once again ahead on points in a one carrier versus one carrier showdown with the enemy carrier, the Lexington, in his cap circle, but way too late with the time remaining to be able to win by flipping the cap. And because the Lexington went for the cap, now too far away to finish off the Pobeda with an airstrike. So plenty there for you to chew over in the comments, although it should be fairly obvious that I certainly don't think the carrier did anything wrong. If not for him, they would have lost. And a secondary builder Margi may not be the most popular choice in kitting out your tier 8 Japanese battleships, but hey, if it's stupid and it works, <laughs> it ain't stupid, and it definitely worked. So, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it, I hope it's given you something to talk about, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.